Right, I've got um, about 20 minutes to explain what I'm going on about here. So um, my role in Historic England, I'm a Principal Inspector of Ancient <laughs> Monuments, so I'm actually responsible for all the development management advice we as an organisation give in Yorkshire. So that's listed buildings, scheduled monuments, protected wrecks, battlefields, um, you name it. Um, anyone who wants to sort of change the historic environment and there's consent process involved, then we are involved in some way. Um, and uh, I've been doing this job now for, for a number of years. Um, and um, I, I like my team, I like them to think about what we're doing and why we're doing things. And um, uh, what I'm going to try and explain to you now is how I have tried to reconcile some of the issues that Linda was struggling with in the day-to-day -day work that I actually do. And I've set up this little um, framework in my own head for thinking, because if I don't have this framework in my head, I will drown, okay? Because it's really, really, you know, sometimes it's really complicated. Now, you've got to know a bit about me to start off with this conversation, and at this point I now have to look at John and blame everything on John, <laughs> because 21 years ago I was his student, okay? And actually some of these issues about value and what we value and how you value and how you ascribe it all come from the conversations that John and I had then. And what's really fascinating is after I left Cambridge, for the next seven years, I was utterly and totally slated for thinking about theory, <laughs> policy, uh, sorry, theory and philosophy and values, yeah? I was told I would never get a job unless I had practical experience. Go away and dig, you bad man. That's just appalling. You've not been an archeologist, okay? Anyway. Eventually, um, after seven years, um, I, I applied for a job at English Heritage, and I got that job, and I was like, well, hey, excellent, all that dirty grime I actually had to go and do was fantastic, until I turned around and asked my colleague who employed me, who, who now actually works for me, um, Dr. Keith Emmerich, why did you employ me? He said, oh, I really love your theoretical background, it was fantastic. <laughs> okay. So the second person I blame for all this is Dr. Keith Emmerich, because actually, he was brilliant. He said, Neil, just go away and think. Yeah, just think about things. It doesn't matter. Thinking isn't bad. You're allowed to do it. Okay. And what we've done in that time is we've just constantly had this huge discussion. And, and this is what this actual paper is. So I'm going to explain to you my Lego movie theory of heritage management. I'm going to use Greek philosophy. I'm going to use the inspectors of ancient monuments as, as created. Um, I'm going to use the idea of my grandfather's axe, and I'm going to use pop music as well, because, hey, all these things have a meaning and a relevance to this conversation. But why the Lego movie? <laughs> OK. Well, the Lego movie is something really simple. It's about those who follow the rules and the instructions, Emmett Brotowski, and it is about those who don't, who are free thinkers, the master builders, who want to actually build with whatever they've got around them and create stuff. Now, overseeing all this, keeping people in control, is President Business. President Business does not like three thinkers at all. He has his Lego instructions, you must build according to that. Okay? Now, what happens in this is he gets so frustrated that there are these three thinkers out there that he, and it has, he finds this thing called the Craggle. This is the Craggle, okay? and on Taco Tuesday, he is going to spray everything with the Craggle. Okay? Now, what is he actually doing? Well, he's going to glue everything together because the subplot of this story is a story between a father and his son. And who does the Lego belong to? It belongs to the dad. And what does the dad like to do? He likes to build according to the instructions. What doesn't he like to do? Is he doesn't like people playing with it and building new things. He gets so frustrated that his son is playing with his Lego that he decides to glue it all together. And ultimately, this is a conversation about how the son changes the dad's mind. This is about freedom of expression. This is about using the stuff that is around you in a really creative way to set up a dialogue, to set up a conversation between people. And ultimately, they have this amazing <coughs> conversation. And the brilliant end point of this whole thing is where the dad then lets the boy's younger daughter into the Lego and she brings down her Duplo and it's all pink and he's suddenly like, oh my god, what are you doing? Okay. <laughs> now, what the hell are you thinking? Has this got to do with heritage management? Well, when I started working for Historic England, I was told to follow the rules. I was told to follow the instructions, the manual book, the policy book. 
Okay, and what did it say? Well, basically it said, I'm an, I'm an inspector of ancient monuments in 1913. I might have had this uniform with a riding crop and I'd come along and I'd have, yes, whack, 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 told you what your heritage is. Yeah, you weren't allowed to discuss it. I was the inspector. Okay, so archaeology becomes finite, non-renewable. I must preserve it. I must keep it all. If I can't keep it in the ground, I have to preserve it by record. I am told this is a Bronze Age barrow with some trees on. I was told trees are bad for archaeology. They are the Satan to an archaeological <laughs> site. You must cut them down. They are evil. Okay. I was told that these things are all good heritage sites. Good. Yes, this is good heritage. This is clean, easy to understand. There's no conflict there. This is what we want. This is the holy grail of heritage. Okay. And I was just given a whole load of language. Yep. Just reams and reams of it. Words that are given meanings. Words that are used to keep you in your place. Preservation in situ. Authenticity. Now there's a cracker. Okay. And it's just overpowering. But the really fascinating thing is when I actually got out into this world and when Keith let me out into this world and I actually started observing, none of it was simple. Okay. So this is that barrow with that tree on. Okay, well I ain't cutting that tree down because it's a fundamental part of the Castle Howard Avenue, one of the most finest designed landscapes in England. Okay, there's nothing wrong with those trees, they're actually part of that place's story. If you actually look in the field next door, there are eight other barrows, all completely ploughed flat. I'm sorry, these trees are the reason why that barrow's upstanding. Okay, nothing wrong with those, and I give consent to replant them any time you ask me. Ooh, what's going on here? Well, this is the Inspectorate of Works effectively cleansing Revo Abbey in the 1920s. So that photo I showed you of Revo Abbey earlier, that's how you see it today? Well, this is what they were doing in the 1920s to create it like that. That is no ruin. This is an artificial creation by the Ministry of Works. This is my favourite, Berkhamsted Castle. What are we doing? We are making Berkhamsted Castle in the 1920s. <laughs> that is a digger up there, reprofiling the moat, okay? Just so that you can all understand it as a Mott and Bailey castle, all right? Do we say this anywhere? Not on your Nelly, all right? The other thing that I found that's really fascinating is this preeminence of fabric, of structure, and of buildings, okay? To me, this is one of the most important places in the world. Okay, has everybody washed their hands today? Yes? Been to toilet, washed your hands. Okay, this is Guest and Crimes, the last remaining brass foundry in Rotherham. It, the Guest and Crimes factory invented the high pressure screw down tap. Okay, they are fundamentally responsible for the provision of safe, clean drinking water to the cities of the world through the valves that were made in this building at this place. Okay, it's also said they invented the New York fire hydrant. Okay. So much so that actually this part of Rotherham is actually known as New York. Okay? And they've just built a football stadium next to this building and they call that the New York Stadium. What does the owner of the football stadium want to do with this building? Knock it down. Okay? But what's really fascinating is if you go round the towns and the cities of the world, you will find guest and crime valve covers everywhere. Okay? This place is far more than just the building. This place is about aspiration. Now, if anyone knows the recent history of Rotherham, with some of the really difficult issues they've had there, the reason why I'm interested in this building is not keeping the building, but it's telling the story of aspiration that someone from Rotherham provided clean drinking water to the world. That's the power of heritage and what we should be actually doing. Not necessarily trying to preserve it. It'll never be a brass foundry. The other really fascinating concept we get to is this idea again of this fabric obsessed approach. Two tube stations on the Piccadilly line in London, okay? Both underwent conservation in 2006. Turnpike is grade two listed, Manor House is not, okay? So with Turnpike, what we decided to do when we were looking at the tiles is take the authorised approach. You must not lose original fabric, so we will only replace the stuff that's broken, and when we replace it, we'll replace it with as near match to when the place was first created. Okay, so if you look at this side, the wall here, you get this lovely mottled effect. 
Why do you get that mottle effect? Because all the tiles that were first put there have aged. They've changed in colour. They've weathered. Okay? So you get a really uh, interesting mottled effect. At Manor House Station, unlisted, they decided what we really want to do is we want to actually try and keep and show to everyone this station as that fantastic modernist design when it was first created. Okay? Because the value here is the design, the architect's intent. The whole point of the Piccadilly line, every station was supposed to look the same and you were supposed to be entering into this modern new world and it was supposed to be all clean lines, very simple. All the architecture is about helping guide you through that place. Okay? So my question is, which is the right one? To replace everything or to replace just a bit? Yeah? Okay? Because to me, that does not address the design value of the architect's intent at all. It's actually eroded that modernist clear design. Okay? Now... Where, where do I get to this? Why are these? Well, hang on, there's, a, there's an image missing. Oh, no. Okay, right. There's a, just imagine a ship up there that's Greek, okay? Right. One of the things I actually found when I actually go around the place is actually how much do you change? How much do you change? And it's all, all of the policies and everything written out there accepts that change actually has to happen. Okay, but we try and do it in this way where we try and do as little as possible and we take little bits and chunks and we try and say it's all right, we're doing it in an authentic style, it doesn't actually matter. And one thing that actually fascinates me is this, this concept of whether things change or not is as old as the houses. So, I use the parable of my grandfather's axe. This is my grandfather's axe, my father replaced the blade and my grandfather replaced the handle. Okay, so is it my grandfather's axe? Right, and everyone goes, oh yeah, that's Trigger's boom, and right? it's all really interesting, isn't it? And we can make it really simple. And I say, yes, it is. But actually what it is, is it's the paradox of Theseus' ship. Okay, so Theseus went off to slay the Minotaur from Athens. He went to Crete to slay the Minotaur. He returned home. When he got home, the Athenians were so happy that he'd done this, that they decided to keep his ship. And they kept his ship, and they lovingly looked after it. And after 500 <coughs> years of replacing tiny little bits of it, they realised they'd replaced half of it. Okay, and so they ask themselves, is it still Theseus' ship? Okay, and you know what? They still don't have an answer. Okay, and what's really fascinating is this whole concept still happening. Anyone know who these delightful ladies are? Sugar, Sugar babes! <laughs> Excellent! This is brilliant. This is pop, pop heritage. Okay, so you have the three original cast members, they all leave one after the other and they all get replaced. The three original cast members read for. Can't call themselves the sugar babes though, because these three girls are the sugar babes. So who are the sugar babes? Okay. Now there are plenty of you who are slightly older in this audience, so I put up here Fleetwood Mac, because it's exactly the same issue. Okay. What is authenticity and does it actually really matter? Okay. And again, what I did have on here was that was an image of thesis of ship. So again, it's this idea that one of the things I've learned from philosophy is there is no blooming answer. Yeah? No policy in the world will give you an answer. What you need is a framework for discussing and thinking about this. And again, here are two classic examples. Stonehenge. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. You know, let's move them all around a bit. Okay, and then my personal favourite is HMS Victory. It's about 10% of the ship laid down in 1765. Why? Because it went through several wars, it's been blown up and everything. So again, this whole idea of what is renewal. It's still HMS Victory, it's still the oldest commissioned warship in the world. It's a machine, it actually has to be replaced to work. If you don't replace it, it won't work. And that brings me back to Lego. <laughs> Because to me, heritage is all about renewal, it's about telling stories, it's about <coughs> changing perceptions, okay? And what's great is Emmett gets there, and the way he gets to it is he just has to write a, a plan first. That's all he does. He's really creative, it's in his mind, but he can't implement it unless he puts it like it's in the Lego instructions, okay? And he makes the thing that saves them all in the end. But this guy is Jan Bormann, he's, he's a German architect, and he goes around playing, repairing bits of stuff with Lego. And my favourite are the top ones. They're the Rice Chancellery in Berlin. And he's changing the perception of what happened to that building. And I just think that's amazing. It's not about preserving it. It's about having a conversation. And when he does this, people stop in the street and help him. Okay? And it's just brilliant. I think it's a way. That's what we should be about. And then down the bottom here is a really interesting example in, in Philadelphia. This is Benjamin Franklin's house, and it's a volumetric reconstruction. 
So it allows you to do and start, start playing around and exploring. And to me, this is what heritage is. So if I strip out all the horror words, I don't like, this is what I get with my heritage lexicon. Yeah, It's about being transparent. It's about ascribing value. It's not about setting down things. It's about democracy. It's about renewal. You know, it's all myth. It's, none of it's fixed. It's all up to play around with. Okay, and we should do it, and it's, it's ours. I've, I could have a huge conversation about the past and the present and all that. All I'll say is the only place you can do this is the present. We can't do it in the past and we can't do it in the future. So let's just drop them, okay? This is about us, who we are. Now, for me, how did I turn this into actually being able to do it in historic England? Well, I have to say it was this document, Conservation of Principles, Policies and Practice. And this is a word cloud search on that document, okay? And it encapsulates pretty much the, everything that I, uh, I employ in the way I do it and the way I communicate to people. And to me, it's about a values-led approach. It's about place, okay? It's about people, all right? It's not about the, the, the list of buildings. They're not, they're stuff, okay? We use this stuff and how we use it is entirely up to us. Now, what's absolutely fascinating is, of course, um, this is where I have to have my disclaimer. I'm talking personally here and not as an employee of Historic England, but um, uh, we are rewriting conservation principles at the moment and it's out for consultation. And here is the uh, word cloud for that document. And what you'll see is suddenly the dominant heritage and asset and value, not values, but value come out and architecture and archaeological so I'll leave you to make your own mind up about what President Business might be doing with the Craggle and um, that document <laughs> but to me this is really challenging because this, this is actually to me actually going to not able us to do some of the stuff that Linda was actually talking about because it's about us creating an authorised heritage again and I'll come on to it again why, why I think we're actually doing that now, an example, another example of this, I'm dealing with one of the most contested places in York at the moment, and all heritage is contested, okay, none of it is, uh, none of it is straightforward. This is the Eye of York, um, right next to Clifford's Tower, and what I've done here and my team do is we have literally done a mind map of the heritage values of the Eye of York, and what we do is we start with the evidential, we work around as illustrative, historic, Aesthetic and communal. This is in conservation principles. It's a framework for thinking. This is just getting your ideas down, and we just stick down everything we actually know about these places. Okay, and what you actually get from that is is some relative values going on in this place. And so it's no surprise about the historic place value that goes on here. But what's really fundamental, and why no one's ever been able to build anything in this place, is actually oh, if that's the one, is the really strong connection between historic value and communal value. Okay, and what this place means to people. This is a site of executions. It's really, really fascinating from when you get people who, uh, you know, from very high up in society all, all the way down. And again, this just forms a way of actually thinking about these places and what they actually mean and actually how you start dealing with them and how you create some responses to them. And um, just to come back to show you how then this again works in practice. Um, this is Revo Abbey. Okay, Revo Abbey floods all the time, and one of the things that's really interesting is, is the visitor centre floods. But in this photograph, what you'll actually see is a building at the top there, which was the old Revo Abbey farmhouse. Anyone know what happened to that? The Ministry of Works pulled it down in 1960, and they pulled it down because it got in the way of telling the story of a medieval monastic site. You can't have a post medieval farm building on a monastic site. It's confusing. Now what's fascinating is when this site floods, that building never ever floods. The visitor centre ends up in about uh, a metre to two metres underwater. That building doesn't. Because hey, the people who built that building knew where the river flooded and they knew where to go. All right. This is um, Hellerfield Peel that featured on Grand Designs. And the reason why I put these slides up for it is this. The Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments from 1908 to 1934, the guy who invented the uniform, Charles Reed Pierce, said this about the process he was applying to monuments. Creative it is not, but rather recreative, if the word will bear the meaning. An understanding of what has been is necessary, 
but imagination must be kept in bounds and not translated into material. Wow. Um, okay, so that's fine. This one here, what was really fascinating is when we went back and asked the locals what they thought, this is a couple of quotes um, from local people about how Hellerfield Peel was brought back to life. So Ken Leek, a local historian, it was an important part of the village and what we have now is not just a fantastic restoration but an occupied house again, taking, taking its place as part and parcel of village life, just as it did a hundred years ago. <coughs> And then David Ellis. This was a guy who actually used to live on the estate when it was actually a country house. Gosh, it has its old image back again. To have it back again is like having your childhood put back right again. It's been restored, and for that I'm infinitely grateful. So again, to me it goes back to this idea about whether you want to actually be this sort of preserving heritage, i.e. which, which period you preserve, or do you want to see heritage as a creative thing, a creative process, that we do, and through that other things might actually happen. Whether we can say that that's our role to, to make other people feel uh, things about it, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but what I want people to do is understand that actually it's, it is creative, it's about creating cultural value, understanding <laughs> cultural value, and, and preservation shouldn't actually form any part of it. Um, and again, I get to here um, to actually reflect back on everything I've said. The best heritage lesson I've ever, ever been taught in my entire life was by my own daughter when she was three years old. Okay? Up there is the Ferris wheel that was put in York in uh, 2005. It was put up the year my daughter was born. And I kid you not, we'd argued for 10 years where this thing should go. Because everybody just just said you can't put a ferris wheel in york that's the disnification of york and it's going to affect the minster okay eventually we got it far enough away from the city center that everyone was happy they put it up um, my daughter was born in 2005 when she was one and a half we went on it we loved it absolutely fantastic okay when she was three we were walking my dog and um, she looked over the river and she saw the ferris wheel and they were taking it down and she said to me daddy why are they taking my wheel away from me and immediately what I realised, what she was actually saying is, for her, that, that was entirely part of her geographical sense. That was her sense of place. But it also showed me, who am I to dictate what the future should be interested in? That's the future's decision. Okay? I can only deal with the present and actually how you talk about it. It makes me then reflect back, back to these guys, and realise they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong in what they were doing. They were applying what their thoughts were at the time. And actually, I'm really lucky that I can come and say, wow, look how crazy they were. Yeah? Well, actually, it was only because they were crazy and did what they did that I can actually say it. So again, it's about placing heritage back in this present. And one, where that gets me is this whole idea of, of whether we're trying to deal with fact or truth or, um, you know, or whether we're trying to deliver right answers or not. Okay? And heritage is much like the legal system. Okay? The legal system doesn't try and establish the truth, it tries to establish the facts. But facts can always be wrong. Okay? Okay? So we can try to say we're delivering the perfect past, but we're always wrong. So should we actually bother in the first place? And the way I like to describe heritage and heritage values to people is like, like a sound curve, a, a sound wave. This is what I do. So up the top there, you, you have my heritage sound wave. Okay, this is how I relate to places. And it goes out there and it's oscillating. <coughs> the problem with my sound wave is if I don't shout about it, it dies out. It flatlines and becomes nothing. Okay? So I see my job as going to turn it up every so often, get in there, have a really good argument, do lots of stuff. Yeah? The only problem, though, is I'm not alone. Everyone has a wave. Okay? And all those waves are oscillating differently. And when they hit each other, they hit conflict and they're all arguing in the... Yeah? So actually, am I like a DJ with multiple sound waves trying to keep more going? Okay? Some will lose, some will win, some will hit. I don't know the answer. Okay? But I do see my role as actually allowing those sound waves to perpetuate. Keep going. You know, explore each other. And that is why, to me, heritage and what I do is awesome. Okay? Because it's not about fixing anything. It's about having some fun. Okay?